Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, chapter 9. We're going to be in chapter 9 tonight. Everybody has a Bible, I see. Wonderful. Perfect. You know, last week, as we were reading in chapter 8, we read about Samuel. And now he's in his senior years. You know, he's grown up from this little boy. We've known Samuel since he was a little child, and taken to the tabernacle by his mother. Now he's in his senior years. He's getting very old. And he makes a big mistake, right? He appointed, he appointed his two sons as judges. Bad no-no. Should never have done that. Should never have done that. And the people were upset. And they were upset because, well, Samuel's some sons were corrupt, just straight up. They were corrupt. They were unjust. They didn't walk in the ways of Samuel, the Bible said. They didn't walk in the ways of their father. And so the, the people were upset, and they came to Samuel, uh, the elders of all the tribes. They came to Samuel, and they demanded of him that he appoint a king for them. Give us a king. Like all the other nations. I want to be like, we want to be like all the other nations. Give us a king. Well, this displeased Samuel. It actually said it displeased him. Samuel knew that God wanted to be Israel's king. God had always wanted to be their king. He didn't want them to have to have a man as a king. And so Samuel knew that. So it dispute, pleased him. But Samuel, as we read there last week, he goes and he does as any good servant does. He goes and prays. He goes but takes it before the Lord and tells the Lord. He prayed first. Guys, prayer is so powerful. You know, I emphasize it from this pulpit so many times on a Wednesday night, on a Sunday. Prayer, prayer, go before the Lord. You got, you got a decision to make. Take it in prayer before the Lord. You got a struggle in your life. Take it before, in prayer before the Lord. See, the idea of a king was no surprise to God. You know that, right? This was no surprise. Not like God was taken off balance and going, wow, man, Israel wants a king. What am I going to do now? You know, what am I going to do? They're wanting a king now. Guys, nothing comes as a surprise to God in our lives either, too. You know, God's never surprised when you do something you do. Or I do something I do. It doesn't come as a surprise. Actually, God had, had told in his word 400 years earlier that Israel would have a king. And the type of king. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy. Just go back from Samuel. Deuteronomy 17. It's on page 282 for those with the Bible, or like the churches. God had told them they would have a king. It wasn't surprising to him. 400 years earlier, he said this. Verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Who the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren. You shall set him as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not go return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. All these little stipulations. Also, it is, shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in the book from the one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him all, and he shall read it all the days of his life. He's to have the word of God before him that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. He's a humble man that he may not turn aside from commandment to the right, from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. This was no surprise. God was not surprised by the re request for a king. It didn't come by any surprise at all. Like I say, he had made provisions for it. And he made provisions of what type of king that he would, would desire, what he would choose. And God would choose the, choose the king. He says in there, whom the Lord your God chooses. We're going to see tonight exactly what takes place. That's exactly what's going to take place. God's going to choose this king. God's going to choose the king. God will set up the man Saul into position to be the king. God chooses him. 
God will anoint Saul to be Israel's king. It's all by God's doing. You know, guys, it's 4th of July. It's the 4th of July. God sets those in power, the presidents, our government. The Bible says so. He sets those in power. He raises up kings and he lowers down kings. Do you believe that? I believe that, absolutely. And sometimes we get what we deserve. You ever think about that as a sinful nation? Maybe we get what we deserve. You know, we, you look through the Bible, all through the Bible, there were good kings and there were bad kings. Israel had to be straightened up and corrected. And so sometimes I think we, we get what we deserve. But God puts them in power and God removes them. In Daniel 2.21, he says, and he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So, okay, God puts all the kings. He puts the presidents in place. He puts the government in place. Why do we vote? Oh, I don't, God's got it all under control, right? Why are we voting? Why are we doing this? Well, Daniel 2.21. You got that up there, honey? Put that back up there. Don't let it go away. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He gives wisdom to those for voting, for putting those kings in position. Yeah, does God allow the vote to take place? Absolutely. You know, God ultimately knows who's going to be in power, guys. We know that, right? That's why we vote. He gives us the freedom. We need to vote. You know, when you vote, are you voting because he's a really good looking dude? You know, I think Clinton was voted in that way. You know, I think some of these have voted in. Or, or, or well, hey, we got to have the first African-American president, and so we're going to vote that way. I know a lot of young people voted that way simply because he was an African-American. We want to be the generation that voted in the first African-American. Didn't look at his morals, didn't look at his integrity, didn't look at his character one little bit. They voted for something else. When you vote, look at the integrity of a man. Look at the character of a man. Look at the godliness of a man. You know, I'm not ever going to tell anybody who to vote for. By no means I'll ever tell anybody who to vote for. But by all means, look for somebody. Gosh, who aligns a little bit with God. <laughs> you know, at least a little bit. So these people of Israel, boy, I got off on a tangent there. These people of Israel had no idea what they were getting themselves into when they're asking for this king. God told them, forewarn them. And he told them, forewarn them. If you guys remember last week, if you're here last week, God said, you'll take. This is what this king's going to do. He's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take. He's going to take your sons, he's going to take your daughters, he's going to take the best of your fields, he's going to take the tenth of your grain, he's going to take your male servants, he's going to take the tenth of your sheep. He's going to take, take, take. And you know, I related that last week to sin in our lives too. I related that to sin and what sin does in our lives, and that's exactly what it does, church. It takes, 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 and it never gives back. You know, there's many out there. There's many out there. And I want to say Christians, those who are saved, that have backslidden, whatever you want to call it. And they fall into sin. And all sin does is take. And then it just starts taking. And it never gives back. Satan doesn't give back, by the way. Satan just takes. So Israel's going to get their king. And it'll be one God chooses. And I want to say for better or for worse. All right, let's pray and we're going to get in our message. I realize that was a long intro. Father, I do thank you again for your word. God, as we go through uh, chapter 9 here, as we read in your word, how awesome it is that words written thousands of years ago is applicable to our lives, Lord. God, your word's amazing. Bless the reading of your word. As always, Lord, more of you and less of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse, uh, chapter 9, we're going to start off in the first couple of verses. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Boy, we need names like that today, you know? Those are cool names, man. Hey, Abrel. How you doing, Abrel? No, my name is Zeror. Anyway, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So this story begins, and it begins with this man. It speaks of Kish, right? And he's a Benjamin. He's uh, from uh, a Benjamite. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. 
You know, Benjamite sandwich, I just couldn't help but say that. <laughs> he's, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, and he's a very wealthy man. It speaks of that. He says a mighty man of power. He was a very wealthy man. And it speaks of him. And then it talks about his very, very choice and handsome son, you know, kind of like me. <sighs> Good thing you're laughing right now. I hope they picked that up on the microphone on the video, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, he has a very choice and handsome son, tall and handsome and strong. And his name's Saul. Now, guys, picture this, because as, as we go through here, we're going to see this is exactly the type of person somebody would pick. You know, I just mentioned, well, well, the president or something of that nature. You know, are you picking them by the way they look? Uh, you know, they, they look like they're presidential. People used to say, I mean, people said to me all the time, you don't look like a pastor. I said, well, I don't know what a pastor's supposed to look like, but I don't own a tie, I'll tell you that one. Um, but anyway, this is exactly the type of king, Saul. We're going to see Saul, he's going to become king. The type of person they would look for. His appearance, he looked the part. You know, they spoke that of our president, right? He doesn't speak presidential. You know, well, no, he doesn't, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I think I speak more presidential than our president does. But anyway, i got to quit getting off on those rabbit trails like that. My wife will be back there having to edit. <laughs> but they go by appearance. I want to tell you, appearances can be deceiving, right? Appearances can be deceiving. You know the old saying, you don't judge a book by its cover? Exactly that kind of thing. Too many people tend to look at the outside of a person. Oh, they look at what they drive. They look at where they live. They look at all these things. They look at how they dress, the way they carry themselves. They look at the outside of a person. Guys, I want you to know God looks at the heart. God looks at your heart. He can see the heart within. We need to put away the appearances. We need, to, we need to discover people's hearts. We need to discover who they really are within. You know, I, there are some beautiful hearts within this uh, body. There are some beautiful hearts, beautiful people. I was telling my wife the other day, and we were, I don't know where we were, but I said, you know what? There's a lot of beautiful people in the world. And I wasn't talking about looks. I wasn't talking about the way they were dressed. I was just talking about their hearts and just, just the way they are, you know? A lot of beautiful people. We need to discover people's hearts. Now, we can't, we can't see a person's heart, obviously, but their character shows it, right? It's their character. It says, from his shoulder upwards, he was taller. Now, this doesn't mean he had this neck that went up like a giraffe or something <laughs> and a big old tall head on top of that, okay? It just means he was taller than anybody else. From his shoulders up, he was taller. Let's go into verse 3. Now, the donkeys of, of Kish, and this is his father, now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, please take one of the servants with you and ri arise and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and then through the land of uh, Shalisha, but he did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalom, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. So he passing through all these lands, he's searching for these donkeys. I love how this story starts out. I don't know if you guys notice it, and God kind of points these things out to me, but the fact that it starts out with an obedient son. His father asked him, go find the donkeys. Take one of the servants and go find the donkeys. Oh, Dad, I'm busy on my Xbox. <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, he's an obedient son, one who honored his father and did what he was told. And I, I, I find that refreshing. And I realize there's children, there's children today that are still obedient, but there's so many that aren't. And there's so many in our society that aren't obedient. Seems to be a, something lost in some of our children today. There's actually disobedience instead. And you've got to wonder why. You've got to wonder why. And just briefly, and I'm just going to throw one thing out that, that I believe is why. Sometimes the son or the daughter doesn't fall too far from the, you know, a chip off the old block doesn't fall too far from the tree. Who the parent is. You know, a child's obedience is based upon who their parents are. Children tend to mimic the tra traits of their parents, or the traits, in my case, of my, 
you know, as a grandparent. Children, grandchildren, will mimic the traits of their parents. You know, the father says, well, why is that? I can't believe he used that, you dropped the F-bomb. Yeah. Well, where do you hear that? Yeah. You go out in the garage and he's, that's all he is, profanities, profanities. And children are going to mimic that. You know, the, the child's talking about somebody else in there and, and they're being mean to him. Uh, they're in junior high or something. They're being mean to the, somebody else and, and basically gossiping, you know, speaking behind their back. Well, where'd they learn that? Well, mom and dad talking about the neighbor over there. You know, they learned it that way. Berating others, putting others down. Do they learn that from the parents? I love the fact that it starts out this, uh, this story and it's an obedient son. And so Saul, he, uh, he goes off and he's out uh, looking for the donkeys. Verse 5. When they had come to the land of Zuf, that's a cool land, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. And he said to him, Look, now there is, now this is a servant saying to Saul, and he said to him, Look, now there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass, so let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give, it, give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, it speaks in here in verse 9. It says, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go see the seer. For he now, who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Samuel was a prophet. So they go to see the seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, well said, young man, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So Saul, even though he's kind of, he's an obedient son. He went out and he's traveled some distance, right? He, he's went into all these different lands and he's looking for those donkeys. But he's getting a little worn out. Ah, I'm getting worn out. I'm tired of chasing donkeys all day long. You ever notice how God uses donkeys a lot, by the way? That's amazing. God uses donkeys. He's getting worn out, looking for these donkeys. He basically tells us, let's, let's go home. My dad's going to be concerned about us instead. Let's just go home. But the servant, you see that in there? The servant. The servant of his father. The servant of the of. The master, basically, the servant of the master comes up with this idea. This servant was more devoted to pleasing his master and finding those donkeys, I think, than Saul even was as the son. He was serving his master. And he said, no, let's, I come up with an idea here. Let's go ask this man of God. You know, those who serve with a heart of pleasing God first, the master, you understand where I'm going with this. Pleasing their master. To, so they serve with diligence, church. They serve with diligence. They don't give up easy. You know, little things don't knock them down. Little things don't back them up. They got perseverance. They stand their ground. Those who are truly serving their master, now if they're serving somebody else, they're serving a man, well, you kind of, you get what you get, right? They're serving themselves, you definitely get what you get. But if you're serving God, they serve with diligence. If that's truly their heart, they're not willing to back down easy. They're faithful in their service to God and they're faithful in their service to others. It's very noticeable who is faithful and who's not in how they serve. This, this servant, he wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to back down. In Colossians 3.23, it says, And whatever you do, I love this scripture, by the way. I share this scripture with high school students. I share this scripture with men's Bible studies. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Whatever you do, church, I don't care what it is you're doing, what job you're doing, who you're doing it for, whatever it is, do it heartily with perseverance and diligence and, and zeal. Do it heartily unto the Lord. Yeah, and, you, and it says, the, uh, knowing that the Lord, from the Lord, you receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. We serve the great King. Whatever it is, your job, whatever it is, ministry, family, 
how you serve your, your, your wife, how you, how you serve your husband, how you, how you serve your friends. Whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Let it show that way. You know what? That is very evident, by the way. There aren't too many good, I'm going to use men. There aren't too, but we can use person if you like. I don't know. There aren't too many Bible-believing, strong employee men that are looking for jobs. I want to know, tell you that right now. They're not looking for jobs. You know why they're not looking for jobs? Because they do everything they do heartily unto the Lord. And they're the best employees. They are good employees and they do everything heartily unto the Lord. They, they go beyond what everybody else does. They're not looking for jobs. Serve the Lord. This, uh, this servant, he wanted to do that. I say always honor, your, honor God with your best. You know what? What did God do for us? Did he give us the leftovers? Did God give us the leftovers? No. He gave us the best. And you know, just one other thing. I realize I'm getting off on this, but when you say you'll do something, do it. You know? That's, that's huge for me. When you say you're going to do something, keep your word. Honor God in keeping your word. When you say you're going to do something for somebody, do it. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, period. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Let your yes be yes. When you say you're going to do something, be faithful about it and do it. God honors. I want you to know God honors. He blesses faithfulness. When you say you're going to do something, stick to it. Keep your word. Let your yes be yes. Otherwise, it's better just to say no. It's okay in this world, guys, to say no. I finally learned that. <sighs> Seriously, I, I, so many times I... Oh, yeah, I can help you with that. I can help you. Well, you get yourself where pretty soon you ain't got no, you ain't got no room. You got no time left. And, and then you're not, let, you're not keeping your yes, yes. It's okay to say no sometimes, too. Pray about it. Verse 6, we got to move on. Well, in verse 6, we read that already. The servant comes up with this idea, right? Of going to see the man. And he's seeking wisdom from the man. He's going to go, they're going to go and seek wisdom from Samuel. This man who knows God, they figure. You know, you look at that in verse 6. And he said to him, look, now there in this city is a man of God, and he's an honorable man. Let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. You know, this obviously shows that Saul himself, this young man Saul, he shows that he really knew, had no relationship with God himself. He didn't have his own relationship with God. He didn't know God. Otherwise, Saul would have sought God for himself. He would have prayed. You know, the children of Israel knew, you seek God. You didn't have to go through this man of God. You didn't have to go through this prophet. There's no record so far that we're reading, by the way, of Saul praying, guys. We see no record of him praying before he left, you know. Hey, he sits down with a servant and says, hey, let's pray to God real quick here and have him you know, pray that he, we can find these donkeys. We don't see him praying about anything. As the servant says, let's, uh, let's go see this man who knows God. When you have a dilemma, a situation in your life, you got a situation, a dilemma in your life, church, seek God first. Before you go out there and seeking, seeking advice from everybody else, you know, they had a situation here. They couldn't find their donkeys. Seek God first. You got a situation in your life. You got a dilemma. Seek God first before you go searching for answers from others. You know, God's wisdom is much greater. And sometimes you got to wait for the answer too, right? We've all been there. In verse 7, it said, Then Saul, Saul said to the servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? What shall we bring the man? Saul was concerned over paying. Paying this man of God. What, what, what can we bring him? What can we give him? Give him something for his service. How are we going to pay this man of God? 
You know, so many guys out in the world, they think the same way. What can I do? What can I do to buy my way to God? What can I do to buy my way to salvation? You know, there's a lot of cults based upon that too, you understand. Cults that are based upon works. You do this, and this is how you get saved. You do these works. They're based upon that. Saul's thinking, well, what can I do to pay? How can we pay for this? People that want to earn their salvation. Well, I'll just be really, really good. If I'm really, really good, no, I'm sorry. You're never going to die. <laughs> you're a wretch, man. You're rotten to the core. You're never good enough. How can I earn my salvation? Doing good works. Oh, I'll help my neighbors. I'll, I'll give to the charities. I'll make sure I drop a whole bunch in that tithing box. On and on and on. They're going to buy their way. You remember in the Acts, where we were studying that Acts, and old uh, Simon, he wanted to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. He wanted to buy God. And Peter said, no, perish with you. Let your money just perish, buddy. They want to buy. They want to buy salvation. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace, church, unmerited favor. Grace is unmerited favor. Favor we do not deserve. I do not deserve the grace of God. Neither do you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift. Praise the Lord. A gift of God. Let me ask you, if I give you a gift, do I expect you to pay me for it? <laughs> Absolutely not. You can if you like. Well, I'll bring you a gift every day and tell you to charge you more. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yeah, because those, those out there... Well, that's why I got my name on the back of that pew, you know. Because I gave a lot. I built that wing over there. I built that children's wing. <laughs> you know what? That's as far as their gift's going to go. Or their, their treasure, I should say. The reward is going to be here, Jesus says. And say, anyone should boast. There's nothing we can do. We know that, right, church? Believe. Believe in the name Jesus Christ. And, the, and you shall be saved. So Saul and his servant, they go to the city and seek the seer. And of course, we already know who this seer is going to be. We know it's going to be Samuel, right? We know who it's going to be. Verse 11. As we move on. And as they went up the hill to the city, they met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? Now, I'm thinking about these young women, okay? I'm sorry, guys. I'm not thinking about these young women, but I'm thinking they're coming down there, right? And here's Saul. He's the most handsome guy in all Israel. He's tall. He's handsome. He's beautiful, you know? I think these girls went out of their way to get in his path, all right? I truly do. And they're all giggling. Dude, look at that! <laughs> you know? I think they got in... They went out of their way to get over there. So as they went, they met in, uh, some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, Yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today came, he came to the city. Today, just today, for today he came to this city. Because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes. Because he must bless the sacrifice afterward. Those who are invited will eat. Oh, and then those will invite who eat. Now therefore, go up, for about this time you'll find him. So they went up to the city. As they were coming into the city, there was Samuel. Man, amazing. Coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. What a coincidence. What an amazing coincidence. Man, he just happens to be there today. Guy they need to see. He just happens to come into the city today. And not only that, he just happens to walk into the city. And lo and behold, who do they find? First man they see, well, there's Samuel coming right towards him. Just today he came to the city. What a coincidence. You know, as I said in my intro, God was going to choose this king. God aligned this. He'd choose the king. He'd put Saul right in the right position. He'd orchestrate the history of Israel. God's in control of everything. Still today, church, still today. It's no coincidence. There are no coincidences. I have come to believe there is no such thing as a coincidence. 
You know, I spoke about months ago how God had my truck break down right out here, coming back from a camping trip. That wasn't a coincidence. God was protecting me. You know, I, had a, I wasn't heading up the spars toe in my trailer. I had a place to pull in. That wasn't a coincidence. So many things. Church, look for that. Look for God's hand in your life. Those things that you might say, well, that just happened to be a coincidence. No, it's not. God is God's orchestrating. He's moving things around. It's, man, that, amazing God. I don't know how he does it. If I did, I, guess, I don't know what to say to that. Anyway, verse 15. Let's move on. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, actually the day before. He told him the day before that Saul, uh, before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him, commander over my people Israel, that they may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Wow. Wow. Samuel's relationship with God, with the Lord, was so close that it literally heard God. He could hear God. Now, did God speak audibly there? I don't know. God can speak audibly there. I don't think he did. I personally don't think he did. He said he heard him in his ear. He heard him. You know, he leaned down and whispered, shh, shh, shh. hey, there he is, right over there. No, I, I think he was so close that he could, his relationship, he could hear what God was speaking to him. Samuel, I believe, was what we would call sensitive to God's Holy Spirit. Very sensitive to God's Holy Spirit and the things of God. Samuel took the time to hear from God. Church, he took the time. Do we, do we truly take the time? You know, our lives can get so stinking busy. We're going and going. And there's noise everywhere, constantly. You know, we got our phones ringing, and we got the TV on, we got our, you know, video games, we got something going on. It's just a constant noise. Do we take the time just to listen to God? I mean, seriously, just take the time to hear God. God speaks in several ways. Number one, God speaks through his word. God speaks through his word. When you read his word, and I know I've mentioned this in service before, but, and I have it Bible studies. When you're reading God's word, don't set yourself a goal. I'm going to read a chapter. Read until God speaks to you. And then stop and listen. Say, God, you just, you just touched me with that scripture right there. Now, what do you want to tell me? What do you want to tell me? Now, listen and take the time. Take the time to listen. He also comes, he, he speaks to us in prayer. But if we're praying, and then we're done with our prayer, now we get up and go. But we don't take time to listen after that prayer. You know, in corporate prayer, it's very uncomfortable when there's silence, right? You notice how that is? It's every, well, actually, that's the best time if you think about it. But most of the time, we don't let that happen. We just keep, somebody else has got to pray. Somebody else has got to pray. If there's a gap, we got to fill it. Where's God going to speak? He doesn't speak in that booming thunder like he did at the Philistines, you know, boom. And, no, a still, small voice, the Bible says. A still, small voice. He also speaks through other people. Be sensitive to what God's doing. So many times you can get confirmation in your life through somebody else. They don't even know it. They have no clue that they're putting confirmation of God in your life. But you get it through these other people. God's Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, uh, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, verse 14, or chapter 14, I'm sorry. Jesus told us about this helper that come and speak to us. Hmm. How come I can't find it? There we go. Chapter, chapter 14, Gospel of John 15, 49. I was going to read all the way from verse, 14, uh, from verse 15, but I'm not. 
I'm going to jump all right down to um, what Jesus is speaking about is, is that when he leaves, I'm going to paraphrase it for you. When he leaves, he's going to leave us with a helper, the Holy Spirit. And we all know that, the Holy Spirit that's indwelled within us. And he was telling his disciples, that I'm going to leave this Holy Spirit with you. Verse 26. We're just going to jump right to the end there. But he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He will teach you all things. To be taught these things, we have to listen to God's Spirit. We have to listen. And when it says, Jesus says, and bring to your remembrance of all things that I said to you, we got to read what Jesus said to us, right? You can't remember what you didn't read. You can't remember what you never learned. We got to be sensitive to God's Holy Spirit. Now, the question may always come up, and I've had so many people say this. How do I know that it's God speaking to me? How do I know? You know, Satan, that dirty devil out there, got his little minions going out there, his little angels sitting over here saying one thing, and you got the devil sitting over here saying something. Which one's speaking? Who, do I, who am I hearing right now? Who am I hearing? 1 John. Go to 1 John. Chapter 4. Page 1749. In 1 John, he says, Beloved, do not believe every, uh, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits. Okay, so right off the bat, we're going, hey, we're not to believe every spirit. Test the spirits, he says. Test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. This is the test. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. The evil one, basically, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world. Listen to this, guys. Read that. Underline it. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He is not he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We're going to get that in a second here. First off, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world. Is it of God? Is it godly? If this confirmation, you're going, well, if this person's speaking to me, how do I know I'm hearing God? Well, number one, test that spirit. Test that spirit. Are those godly people? Are they sharing that with you in a godly manner? Is it, is it for your edification is there, or for their own agenda? Okay? Now then when we come into whether, let's say you're, you're, you feel God speaking to you in the spirit, there again, test it. Is it godly? You guys know what's godly. Test it by his scripture. If the Spirit of God is telling you to go uh, rob the store down here, trust me, it's not the Spirit of God telling you to do that. It's just not. You test the spirits. If it's coming from God or not. Because there is a spirit of error too. So Samuel heard God. Now what he was going to do, he's going to act upon it. That's the most important part, guys. You hear God in your life. I'll tell you what, sometimes the hardest thing to do is act upon when you hear God. God speaks to you. He tells you, do this. And you're like, man, can't you use somebody else? Somebody else go do it. I'll tell you what, if you refuse, God will let you refuse, by the way, most of the time. Somebody else will do it. Don't think that you're so special. If I hadn't answered the call to come down here to Wheelthwaite, God would have brought another man. Period. Period. If I hadn't answered the call, it's not like, you know, oh, he's the only one. No. I just answered the call. I heard the call. I heard God. And here's where I'm at. Thank the Lord you did. Amen. 
Well, I'm, I'm blessed to be here, brother. I'm truly blessed to be here. And I know it's God. It's not me. So he heard God, and now he's going to act upon it. In verse 18, where we left off, he says, Then Samuel called the people together. Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong chapter here. There we go. Verse 18. Um, then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where is the seer's house? Uh, Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow you will let you go and tell you all that is in your heart. Well, that's crazy right there. We're going to get back to that. I'll tell you all that's in your heart. But as soon as, as, as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, what do you know about my donkeys? Do not be anxious about them, for they have been found, and on whom is, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Ask him this question. Is it not you and all your father's house? Saul's just getting his mind blown here. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribes of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? <laughs> wow. Like I said, Saul must have been getting his mind blown away. He walks into this town and immediately finds who he's looking for, number one. We discussed that. He immediately finds Samuel. Samuel invites him to dinner. Come on, dude, you're going to go up to me with dinner. And, you know, all I wanted to know is about my donkeys. I haven't even got to that part yet. Didn't even need to ask him that, in fact. He must have been blown away. He invites him to dinner. And then Saul, I mean, Samuel reassures Saul that the donkeys are okay. How did he know about my donkeys? I didn't even mention my donkeys. I never talked about them. How did he know that? And then, probably the most freaky part, <laughs> the most freaky part, is when he tells them uh, at their first encounter, when you think about this, I will tell you all that is in your heart. Wow. Man. Somebody come up to me and be able to say, I'll, I'm going to tell you everything that's in your heart. Oh, dude, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't go into that, that zone in there because there's some pretty wicked stuff there, man. There's some pretty wicked stuff that's been buried in that heart and that mind and that thoughts, you know. That's scary. You know, we can hide a lot about ourselves to people. We truly can. My pastor at, uh, in Prescott there, Pastor Al, he's Italian, and he used the word fugazi. And fugazi means to be a fake. And he says it's really easy sometimes for a Christian to be a fugazi. Because they come into, you know, come into church and they put on a whole new, you know, like a whole mask, whole suit and everything, right? You, and, and you can hide who you really are. And especially what you're thinking and what your motives are. There's many times you can hide that real easy. But see, God sees your heart, right? We talked about the, that earlier. What's in the heart of a person? God knows our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Well, I tell you what, God. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. It's God who can see the heart. Samuel is going to tell Saul, his heart. Wow. Like I say, you might be able to hide things from others. You might be able to hide that, that sin. Just straight up. You might be able to hide that sin, that secret sin from others, but you're not hiding it from God. You're not hiding it from God. God knows where we stand, church. God knows where I stand, within my heart and mind. That's why we confess our sins. You know that? Because we're all sinners. Sometimes our mind, my mind will go someplace and I'll go, where did that come from? Seriously, where did that come from? And I just say, God, forgive me. That's such a wicked heart, wicked mind. God knows where you stand. He knows your motives. He knows your agenda. He knows your hateful thoughts. God knows everything. And that's why we confess our sin. Come clean before God. Come clean before the cross. Ask God, forgive me. You know, God knows we're going to sin again. Verse 20. In verse 20, it said that... Uh,
Where am I at there? Oh, for Samuel, chapter 9, verse 20, yeah. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel. Now, this is like a prophecy that he throws out there. He throws this out there. Uh, he says, on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not you and all your father's house? And I love the way that Saul answered him. Saul answers him and says, Am I not a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, which they were, the Benjamin, or uh, the tribe of Benjamin was the small tribes, and my family, the least of all the families? No, 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 this is a very powerful man, very wealthy man. I love it in there. He shows great humility. Saul, the way he was, he showed great humility before Samuel. I mean, he could have puffed up, well, yeah, all the desire of Israel. Isn't my family the greatest of them all? And your father's house. He grows, shows great humility, and I like that. Humility before other people, church. Humility before other people shows humility before God. You know the definition for humility is strength under control. Actually, you have to be stronger. You have a greater power in humility than you do with your pride. Anybody can throw their pride out there. But when you can be humble before others, and especially humble before God, it takes great strength, and it's strength under control. Humility. Like I say, pride and arrogance, well, we know what that produces. It produces sin. Pretty much cut and dry, right? That's all it's going to produce. But humility is strength. It's power. Psalm 147, 6, the Lord lifts up the humble. He cast down the wicked. He cast the wicked down to the ground. God lifts up the humble. Don't we want to be lifted up? James 4, 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Let God lift us up. We don't need to lift ourselves up. I'll tell you what, that's the number one thing I fight is my pride. And I don't know too many people that don't, aren't that way, especially men. Especially men. We fight our pride to humble ourselves before others and before the Lord. My pride try to get, gets the best of me all the time. So like I say, in here it said then, all the desires of Israel. Now this was a prophecy towards Saul. All the desire of Israel. Samuel was speaking of a des Israel's desire for a king. Remember, we want a king. We want a king. This is the guy. You are the desire of all Israel to have a king. He didn't know what he was talking about at the time, though. We've got to have a king before us. Let's move on. Verse 22. Now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portions which I give to you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the thigh and its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here is what was kept back. It was set apart for you. <laughs> Dude, it was set apart for you. Already done. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you since I, since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. <laughs> Man, he gets Saul getting the royal treatment. You know his servants getting the royal treatment too, right? His servants sitting right up there too. He's going, man, I've never been at the head of the table before. I've never been up here. This honorable place, this royal treatment. <laughs> and it has, must have had him wondering what's going on, right? What's going on? And this, he tells him in verse 23, he says, this portion of meat had already been set aside for you. Guys, God prepares ahead of time. Good things for his children. Always remember, he prepares that ahead of time. Verse 24, actually Samuel tells him, Saul, that it, he set it aside especially for him, especially for Saul. Saul's going, wow, what's going on here? You know, when he, when he set that before him, I think Samuel was probably, he, he was probably undoubtedly just waiting and watching Saul at that time and seeing how he's going to behave, right? Testing him kind of. Put him in this place of honor. Would he respond to this great honor? How is he going to respond? He's going to respond with pride or with humility? Pride or arrogance? Would he be humble and grace-filled? 
How's he gonna, how's he gonna respond to these accolades? You know, how do you respond to accolades? When you do something for the Lord and somebody gives you accolades, somebody gives you kudos for what you're doing. Give it to God. Exactly. Give it to God. You know, so many times I have stepped down from this pulpit and on a Sunday or something and somebody said, man, that was a great message. Really touched me right here. And I tell them, give it to God. It's not my message. Give it to God. How do you receive those accolades? Give it back to Him. Last couple of verses. Verse 25 through 27. We're going to finish up. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early, and, and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on top of the house. You Notice know, Samuel was on top of the house praying, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. And as they were going down the, the, the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go ahead of us. And he, and he went on, But you stand here while that I may announce to you the word of God. So they get back from this big feast and everything, and, they, and, and Samuel takes him up to the top of the house, up on the roof to speak with him. And we really don't know what Samuel spoke with Saul on that roof that night. Most likely, Samuel was sharing his heart of what it was to be a godly man. You ever do that with somebody? Maybe a, your, your son or, or a teenager or something. And just really share your heart and get deep. He was probably sharing his heart and, and what kind of man that God would want Saul to be. What type of man? How he should honor God with all his heart. How he should be kind and uplifting to others. How he is to treat the children of Israel. How he would be stepping into this new season. And, and you know, there'd be many watching him. And it'd be a new season for Israel also. First time they ever had a king. Probably talk to him about that, about that. Perhaps, remember where I shared with you in Deuteronomy 17? Perhaps he shared that scripture back there. God said, I will choose a king. And he gave all that list of stuff. Perhaps he shared that with him. This is the king God wants of you, Samuel. So on verse 27, the next day he goes out there and before he leaves, he says, send your servant on. Send him on down the road there and I'm going to talk to you for a few more minutes. He says, I'm going to reveal the word of the Lord to Saul. I'm going to reveal the word of, the, of God to you, Saul. What the God has said. God has said that you're going to be the king. Now, whether he told him that night, I don't know. Whether he just told him that morning, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, as we get into chapter 10 next week, we'll see that uh, he anoints Saul as king. He reveals the word. God prepared and he planned those days. And guys, he prepares and plans our days too. God prepares good things for his children, those who love him, those who follow him, those who obey him. Main thing is we've got to have to let him have his way, you know? How are we going to follow God? How are we going to be sensitive? Sensitive to God's Holy Spirit and his leading. God's plan for God's man or God's woman. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the body of Christ, Lord. God, once again, we thank you for our country. Lord, that you might... Uh, that this country, as Christians, we might bless you as much as you blessed us, Lord. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.